what is the Cyrus Cylinder and what exactly does it say? The Cyrus Cylinder does not say what you expect it to say. Let's just start right there. The Cyrus Cylinder is supposedly the decree given by the Persian. Now we're moving down into the Persian period. The Persian King Cyrus that allows all of the exiled Jews to return to Jerusalem. And so this is from Ezra 1, 2 through 4, right? This is, um, if we have that text, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, right? So it specifically says the, the name Yahweh. It specifically gives the name of the Hebrew God. The God of heaven has given all the kingdoms of the earth to me, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, in Judah, right? So it specifically mentions the name of the Hebrew God, and it specifically mentions Jerusalem. This is in Ezra. Mm -hmm. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, right? So again, you get a specific mention of Jerusalem and of Yahweh again. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So again, you get a, it's very, very repetitive. There's a clear specific. message that's being right. driven home here. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold. He's going to pay them, give them some money. Here's I'm going to give you some money. Go back and rebuild, right? With goods and animals, uh, besides free will offerings, the house of God in Jerusalem. So here's a fourth one, right? The temple in Jerusalem. So you get multiple references in these three verses to the Hebrew God by name and the temple in Jerusalem by name. Mm -hmm. So now the Cyrus Cylinder is this actual, the text of the actual decree by Cyrus emancipating these peoples that the Babylonians had exiled. What's interesting is when you actually decipher, when you actually read, translate the text of this cylinder, uh, I do not think that word means what you think it means, right? I, I, it does not say what it we think it says. So if we look at the text of the cylinder, um, this is always, this is always, when I teach this, it, the students are like, wait, what, what, what time out? Um, the cylinder actually credits not the Hebrew God, not Yahweh, but it credits the Babylonian God, mm -hmm. Marduk, by name specifically for this, this uh, emancipation, which is interesting because uh, Cyrus is Persian. So this is a pretty clever political move. It's a great when, move. It's a great political move because when the Persian king comes in and conquers Babylon, he doesn't say, my God, right? This we was uh, her Mazda, right? My God allowed me to conquer your people and your God. What he does is he says, hey, your God invited me to come in here and conquer. What are they going to say, right? Well, 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 no, he didn't, right? No, it's he's giving credit to the Babylonian God. So he says, the text of this cylinder says, Marduk. The great Lord who nurtures his people saw with pleasure his, this is Cyrus's, fine deeds and true heart and ordered that he should go to Babylon. He had him take the road to Tintu. This is uh, to Babylon. And like a friend and a companion, right? He walked at his side. So basically he's saying, your God, Marduk, came and like a true friend walked by my side and said, come, conquer Babylon, Right. And what's interesting is that the Cyrus Cylinder never once gives credit to Yahweh. It gives credit to Marduk, and mm -hmm. it never once mentions Jerusalem. It's a general emancipation of all captives. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't mention Jerusalem. So when you go through and look at the actual text of the Cyrus Cylinder, and, you know, I'll just, I can skip through it. it you know, we can put the text up on the screen there, but when you, when you listen to the text, it says, and as for the citizens of Babylon, whom, and, and it's Nabonidus, whom he had made subserving in a matter, unsuited for them against it. So all these people who were forced to come to Babylon, 
I release them from their weariness and loosen their burden. The great Lord Marduk uh, rejoiced in my deeds. And then he mentioned some of these people, right? Uh, Asher, Susa, Agade, Eshnuna, all these, some of these other cities, but he never mentions Jerusalem. And I returned their sa these sanctuaries, the images that had been in them. I made their dwellings permanent. So I rebuilt some of their temples, but it never mentions Jerusalem. And so, so if, you're, yeah, yeah, go if, ahead. if you're if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I thought this was an episode on evidence for, why are you tagging the Cyrus Cylinder here at the end? This is one of those where I think it's really important to know, again, what does it really say? Because if you're just right. familiar with Ezra's version... We have a parallel in some of the, as you said, emancipation side of this, mm -hmm. which is a very different thing than we've been getting before. This isn't just an I conquered list. This is right. an I'm letting go home list. Right. But the Cyrus Cylinder is one that people usually think, because of Ezra, is going to say all of these things when it really doesn't. Correct. It does confirm some of the return policies that we see in the Bible, but doesn't have all this naming stuff that we have in the Bible. That's right. So, yes, it's true that the Persians, King Cyrus, allowed a decree to go forth that basically said, what are all these foreign peoples doing here? Go home. Get out of here. I, I don't want you here. Here's some money. Get out of here, right? Yes, that's true. But of course, the Judahites saw this as their God being at work. And what is interesting is I think this is what is lying behind the text of Isaiah 45. I think the authors, the author of Isaiah 45, understands what the Cyrus decree actually says and understands that it doesn't actually mention specifically the Hebrew God and Jerusalem. And so we get this idea that it's their God at work, even though they might know that it's not specifically mentioned. And so you get this text that says in Isaiah, the start in, in verse one, thus says the Lord, this is Yahweh, to his anointed, to his Messiah, mm -hmm. Cyrus, and we can do a whole other thing on that, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue the nations, et cetera, et cetera. I will go before you, level the mountains, break into pieces, et cetera, et cetera. I give you the treasures. This is verse three. Uh, skip down to verse four. For the sake of my servant Jacob and my and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. Mm -hmm. So you you have this idea. I am the Lord. There is no other. Uh, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me. And so what I think is going on here in Isaiah 45 is this another very clever theological trick. So the, the king of Persia is doing a theological trick and giving credit to Marduk. And I think the author of Isaiah 45 is doing a similar trick. The Cyrus Siller never, never mentions Jerusalem or Yahweh. And Isaiah 45 is saying, that's fine. Our God is actually working behind the scenes. You don't even know that right. it's actually our God working behind the scenes doing this. Which, How do you prove that? You, you can't. All the, all the Judahites know is that they got to go home and they're giving credit to their God, regardless of whether Cyrus is giving credit to Mardu or not. But what we do have is extra biblical evidence of this decree of emancipation that allowed the Judahites to return to Jerusalem. By the way, they got to rebuild their temple and they became a, a Persian province and they got mm -hmm. to practice their religion. They got to practice Judaism because of King Cyrus.